so I'm going to talk about surgery. And as a surgeon, we kind of think if you can cut it out, it's better. But not everybody agrees with that. And it sort of depends on the stage and extent of disease, because now we do have some pretty good drugs for, for these tumors, although they're not great. Uh, we have peptide-rated receptor therapy. So there are a lot of different ways to treat these tumors. But in general, uh, surgical management is, is preferable if, if it's possible. So we're going to talk about things about surgery. And I'm going to review some of the stuff that Dr. Dillon talked about as well. And that's one of the things about today, too. If, if you get a lot of information and it just seems overwhelming, you're probably going to hear it again. So it helps to reinforce some of these ideas. And you know, the first thing I wanted to talk about was what, what Dr. Dillon talked about, which is what a neuroendocrine cell is. And it's basically a cell that looks like a neuron. And as he mentioned, it's through, these can be throughout the body, and they can form tumors throughout the body. And they make hormones. And hormones like serotonin or histamine, as he mentioned, and tachykinins. And these can do weird things with blood pressure and cause flushing and diarrhea. And then, as he mentioned, on the cell surface, there are these receptors that are good targets for therapy, the somatostatin receptors. He mentioned also, he showed a different picture uh, that looked at the rising incidence of small bowel and pancreatic and other kinds of neuroendocrine tumors in the population. And you can see that uh, we start in 1970 and go up to about 2012, and over this 40-year uh, journey, about there's been about an eight-fold increase in small bowel neuroendocrine tumors, and and pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors have also markedly increased in incidence. And why this has happened, we don't really know. It's not really so much that perhaps there's something in the environment that's giving everybody these carcinoid tumors. It might be more that we have better scans available. And the practice of medicine has changed over the last 10 or 20 years, where almost anybody who goes to the emergency room with abdominal pain gets a CAT scan, and a CAT scan might pick these tumors up. So it might have to do a lot with the way that medicine is being practiced rather than some uh, thing in the environment, although we all got to worry about cell phones and microplastics and all these things that we have to deal with now that you know 50 years ago weren't as big a problem, and whether they play a role or not. We don't know. Um, stage of diagnosis. So, so Dr. Dillon mentioned localized tumors, which means the tumors in the, say if it's a small bowel tumor, it's in the wall of the small intestine, versus a regional tumor, which goes to lymph nodes, or distant, which means it's metastatic. It's spread to the liver or the bone or somewhere else. Now, if we look in a national cancer database, for small bowel neuroendocrine tumors, which is one of the most common uh, neuroendocrine tumors, they say about a third of those are localized, 40% have lymph node metastases, and 30% have distant metastases. Again, this is from a large database over 40 years or so. In pancreas, then less are localized, more go to lymph nodes, and even more are metastatic. But in our practice at Iowa, we don't see the exact same pattern. We see that 85% of people with small bowel neuroendocrine tumors have involved lymph nodes, and about three quarters have liver metastases. And a lot of that's a referral bias. I mean, we're a major center where people come from a lot of different places, and uh, patients who have localized tumors might be taken care of in their community, and they don't come to see us. So this is kind of reflects our practice. In pancreas, though, it's the opposite. We see about half the people have involved nodes, so that's more, but we see less patients with metastatic disease. And that's probably because uh, in major centers as well, more of these tumors are diagnosed with these special tests of the pancreas that, that identify these earlier on. So you'll see some regional differences in the stage of presentation. Now, Dr. Dillon had a picture that had this. I kind of took out the small intestine and the pancreas with regard to the staging. And there are marked differences in how long people live in these big national databases, which look across the country and have patients for over several decades. But if you have a small bowel neuroendocrine tumor and it's localized, the median survival, that means half the people live longer than this and half the people don't live as long, is 170 months. Now, if you have lymph nodes involved, it doesn't go down that much, only to about 145 months. But if you have metastatic disease to the liver or elsewhere, then the survival goes down to about 70 months, median. This is all comers, and this reflects several decades. So, you know, we're doing better than that in many places, but this is national numbers. 
For pancreas, patients live even longer if they have localized disease, 235 months. But once lymph nodes are involved, there's a precipitous decrease down to 95 months. And if you have metastatic disease in this national database, it's 20 months. Now, our experience is much longer than that, and in, in many centers now with the advent of uh, better treatments, these numbers are going up. But this is just kind of an idea of how important stage of disease is. Now, I'm going to be talking about surgery, and, and uh, in the last 20 some odd years, I've done about 659 operations for neuroendocrine tumors. This is about a year old or so. A lot for about 400 for small bowel neuroendocrine tumors, and, and a few hundred for peanuts, then, you know, other neuroendocrine sites like colon or lung lesions that metastasize to the liver and so forth. And, and what I'm going to be talking about is my experience with, uh, you know, over 300 cases of liver cytoreductions, and then a lot of those cases we also take out the primary. So just to, you know, just to let you know that this is from seeing a lot of patients, this is kind of my philosophy and, and the philosophy of our group. Um, so let's start by talking about small bowel neuroendocrine tumors. These are also sometimes called carcinoid tumors. Um, this is the original one that uh, Dr. Dillon mentioned was uh, uh, originally described in 1907. These are the most common GI site of neuroendocrine tumors. And the incidence is about 10 or 12 per million. And if you do autopsy on people in the normal population, about one in 150 people are going to have these tumors found at at autopsy. Fifty percent of people have more than one tumor in their small intestine, and that's really important. And usually they're well differentiated. And Dr. Dillon showed that picture of the, what the cells look like under the microscope. And well differentiated means they look really orderly and not degenerating and, and uh, really uh, wild looking, which is what the high grade tumors look like. So they're generally well behaved under the microscope. But despite that, they continue to grow slowly but they often will metastasize. And so, and as he mentioned also, some people have these tumors for years before they're diagnosed. And by the time we see them, they may have spread to the liver. Now the workup, is, uh, we generally do history and physicals on everybody. And on history, a lot of people are gonna have symptoms of flushing or diarrhea. Some people have bronchospasm. Some people will have heart failure because in more advanced cases you can have carcinoid heart disease. And on physical exam, you may just look at somebody's face and see that they flush frequently and they'll have a kind of a ruddy appearance. You might feel a palpable liver underneath the, the edge of their uh, ribs suggesting liver metastases or swelling of the legs that suggests carcinoid heart disease. They may have abdominal discomfort uh, or, or bloating. The biochemical testing, Dr. Dillon talked about very nicely, and I'll just revisit that in a few minutes. And imaging, we're going to, you know, as he mentioned, we use CAT scans, MRIs, and DOTA PET scans, and I'll show you pictures of those in a minute. And then endoscopy. Endoscopy or colonoscopy is not usually very useful for finding these tumors. Uh, colonoscopy only looks at the large intestine. And a lot of these tumors are at the junction of the large intestine and the small intestine. So when you do colonoscopy, you, you might see the end of the small intestine. So some will be diagnosed at that point. But the idea that you can reliably diagnose these tumors uh, that way is, is not really correct, because many of them are a little bit further back and will not be seen by colonoscopy. So it's not a very good screening test. The markers that, that we use, as Dr. Dillon mentioned, is serotonin. Chromogranin and pancreastatin are the, the workhorses that we use to follow over time, and these are very helpful to kind of know if people's tumors are progressing, but we also use scans to help tell us that. But the, the two together can be very helpful. And looking at three of the markers we think is better than one, because many places they just look at chromogranin, because that's the only one that's recommended by some of the major cancer organizations. But we find that looking at all three is a little more helpful because sometimes, as he mentioned, one is elevated and the other two are not. Um, but it's not absolutely important. These markers, there's a lot of controversy about the value of markers. Uh, and they're not particularly good for diagnosis, um, but good for following patients. And then in, in the urine, checking a 5-HIAA level or hydroxyindolacetic acid can be helpful for the diagnosis. 
it's a little cumbersome to do for follow-up because nobody wants to collect 24 hours of their urine and put it in the refrigerator uh, before every visit. Uh, now the imaging option, Dr. D D Dylan mentioned that CAT scans are the workhorse and, and I really like CAT scans because I can see the whole abdomen and this is just a picture, well let me just step back and say okay this is a, a CAT scan and this is taking a picture of uh, it's what we call a coronal image and that's a cross section up to down, okay so this is the head is up here and the feet are down here and this is a cross section through the middle of the abdomen up and down. And here you can see a liver metastasis, this kind of dark area here. This is the gallbladder, so don't be fooled by that, but that's a big liver metastasis. And then you can also see some enlarged lymph nodes. And if I looked at a scan like that in somebody who had symptoms of abdominal pain, I would know pretty right off the bat that they have a carcinoid tumor or a small bowel neuroendocrine tumor. Now MRIs are really good for the liver, uh, and so this just shows even better that liver metastasis, and it's not so good for the lymph nodes, and the lymph nodes can often be the most subtle sign that we'll see on a CAT scan to make the diagnosis. And then the DOTA PET scans are really excellent, um, and this just shows that this is the same person who had all three of these. This is a copper scan, which is a good scan, but sometimes the, the films that we get don't show the liver lesions very well because they're, they're overblown, but if you, if you look at it the right kind of monitor, you can see those really well. With the gallium scans, we see them really well, and you can also see the lymph node metastases uh, light up. And I'll show some other pictures that show the value. These are really good scans to look at the whole body to see if they're bone metastases, or sometimes I'll see like weird areas of lymph nodes that I wouldn't have known from the CAT scan but I'm keyed into it by the, the DOTA PET scan, and I know that if I'm gonna operate, I wanna look for those areas. So I found it to be very useful preoperatively, but for the insurance reasons that Dr. Dillon mentioned, we don't always get them postoperatively, except when we think we're gonna change our therapy or maybe go towards the therapy of peptide radioreceptor therapy, just because insurance companies don't like us to get them that often. They don't mind us getting CAT scans or MRIs, but, um, the DOTA PET scan is a little more of a lift. And this just shows that on this particular scan, you really can't see that, but actually in most, most of the DOTA scans, it's really, really good for looking at liver lesions. And it actually, you know, sometimes it's scary to look at these scans. You look at these scans and you'll see dots all over the place. And you go, you, you know, I, I am reluctant sometimes to show those to patients because, you know, you just see this, uh, these spots everywhere in the body, but the fortunate thing is that a lot of these tumors don't really do much. They just sit there, especially the, the lesions and bones. They might, lo it might look terrible when you look at a scan, but in many of those cases, the, those things are fairly dormant and they don't lead to fractures and, and they can be controlled uh, and don't need intervention. But the liver lesions and other things like that are the, the areas that worry us more. Now, we, as far as the carcinoid syndrome goes, um, carcinoid syndrome is something that people with small bowel tumors get sometimes. Usually they don't get it unless the tumors are metastatic. And the reason for that is that these hormones that are made by the tumors are usually broken down in the liver. But when the tumors have spread to the liver, then they, they release the hormones that go beyond the liver and don't get broken down. And then they can cause symptoms of flushing and then diarrhea and sometimes that'll lead to carcinoid heart disease where people get, from the serotonin levels, they get fibrosis uh, of the valves on the right side of the heart. That's where all the blood is coming out of the liver. Uh, and sometimes patients will need valves replaced because of that. And then sometimes people will get asthma or bronchospasm. Now there are something called the five E's that, that can bring about these symptoms. And one is eating. The other is epinephrine or adrenaline. If you get worked up and makes adrenaline, it could cause flushing or, or diarrhea or bronchospasm. Emotion, which is kind of similar to the adrenaline. And then ethanol or alcohol, taking a drink, a drink of wine sometimes. Some people who have these tumors will turn bright red after they drink a, a glass of wine. And then exercise can bring it out also. So this is a typical patient that I might see in clinic who's had 10 years of diarrhea, he's had crampy abdominal pain that's been getting worse over the last few years, and we get a CAT scan. And this is a CAT scan that's now looking 
with the patient lying down, and this is the patient's back, and this is their front, and we're doing a cross-section through the abdomen. And what we're seeing is right here, there's kind of a mass in the right lower quadrant. This is in the area where the small intestine meets the large intestine. And if we cut another slice on the CAT scan and look a little bit lower, we'll see some calcified lymph nodes right next to that tumor. And that immediately is a red flag for a carcinoid tumor, because this could be a colon cancer or something else. But when you see those calcified lymph nodes, it's a very good sign it might be a carcinoid. And then if we look even lower down in the pelvis, we see some, a loop of intestine here. And this is a very thick-walled loop of intestine. This is kind of the more normal small intestine. This is a thick-walled, congested intestine, probably because of those big lymph nodes are keeping the blood flow from uh, returning out of the bowel. And so these tumors of the small bowel originate in the wall of the intestine. So the, the, the intestinal wall has muscle, and it's got some fat, it's got a lining, and it's kind of in the right within the wall where these tumors develop. And as they develop, they will then spread as they get larger into the regional lymph nodes. And the lymph nodes sit in what's called the mesentery. The mesentery is, this, is kind of a fatty sheet of tissue that the bowel is suspended from that contains blood vessels and lymph nodes. And so the, they'll kind of spread from here up along the lymph nodes, and they can even spread higher. And they can also enter the circulation that goes up to the liver, and the liver's up here, but this vein travels up to the liver, and that's how you get liver metastases. And so what, what our job is when we take out these tumors is to take out that section of intestine with the mesentery that contains the blood vessels and the lymph nodes. Now this is just a picture of we, we, we did a study where we looked at over 100 consecutive patients and where their tumors were in the small intestine. And this is the beginning of the small intestine at zero, and this is the end, which is 500 centimeters. So that's, the, the small intestine is really long, and the job of the small intestine is to absorb nutrients. And it's 18 feet long in an average person. So that's really, really long. So you can afford to lose a few feet here or there if you have a tumor in there. But when we looked at these patients, these ye little yellow dots designate where the tumors were. And so they really cluster at the end of the small intestine. We only found one that was at the beginning of the small intestine, but the vast majority were kind of at the last three feet of the small intestine. But um, this, is, this is just a designation of where people who had only one tumor was. But when people had more than one tumor, which was 54%, they could kind of s span much larger distances. And we actually had one patient who had 129 tumors. And you can see a lot of people have five or eight tumors. And fortunately, a lot of times they're kind of clustered together. So you don't have to take out really huge sections of the bowel. They're usually in a certain area where you can remove them all with one resection. When you have 129, it's a little bit harder. But uh, in general, the, the important concept is that these things can be multifocal. And it may not just be one lesion. And we'll talk about why that's important in a minute when we talk about uh, approaches for removing them. So when we explore patients surgically, we usually make an incision kind of in the middle of the abdomen. And it sort of depends what our objectives for the surgery are, how big that incision is. If people have liver metastases and we have to take care of liver disease, it's going to be a big incision. In some patients, we're just going after the tumor and the lymph nodes, and we can do that through a relatively small incision. But Many of the people that we see have, you know, more advanced disease, so we're going to use a, a larger incision. And it will look kind of like this in the midline. And then once we get in there, we start, we free up the small intestine, and then we feel it with our fingertips. And it's really important to feel it with your fingertips because of this multifocal issue, because you can feel with your fingertips something the size of a grain of rice or smaller um, whereas sometimes if you do these cases with a laparoscope or you're using metal graspers to feel stuff, you can't feel anything like that. And you may only see the one big tumor, but there might be six or eight more in there. So it's really important to feel them with your fingertips. And an experienced surgeon will feel all of those tumors and can know where they are and plan their operation accordingly. And this just shows that patient I showed you the CAT scan with the three different cuts from 
when we go in there, this is what the small intestine looks like. And I hope I'm not grossing you guys out because you ate breakfast and stuff, and, but you're here to learn. So this is what your small intestine looks like. This is normal small intestine. It's kind of pink, and this is a normal size. But down here, this is also small intestine. Remember that third picture that showed the thick and loop of intestine in the pelvis? Well, that's what it looks like in real life. And you can also see these little uh, stitches I put in here. These are three different tumors here. And then if we look a little further down, we see why the bowel is so big. There's another tumor that's even bigger that's blocking the bowel right here. And the bowel upstream is obstructed and it's really, really thick. And then downstream of that, it's decompressed. And this bowel just looks sick and it's just, it's uh, drainage of blood is not very good and it's thickened because of this chronic obstruction. And a lot of patients will present with a bowel obstruction and need some kind of emergency surgery. And usually when surgery is done in an emergency setting, it's not quite as good as it would be if it's done electively. That's because when your bowel's obstructed, it gets really big and the risk of it leaking when you hook it back up to, again is much higher. And so if you can kind of do this electively, before somebody's really sick, they're gonna usually do better and you can take out more lymph nodes and do a better job with the cancer. <laughs> so there's, there's the biggest lesion, but there were, this person had three other lesions. And so what we do, let's say the tumor's at the end of the small intestine, what we're gonna do is we're gonna divide the intestine before and after. And so if it's at the end of the small intestine, we have to take part of the colon, that's the cecum. That's what we call that at the beginning of the, of the right colon. And then we remove these blood vessels with the lymph nodes. So you can see these little dots, and I get my fingers on uh, the lymph nodes, and we, we try to pull those down off the major blood vessel, but make sure there's good blood flow to the rest of the intestine. So we divide the bowel, and then we take out the lymph nodes, and then after we remove that section, we hook it back up again. Um, this is just a couple intraoperative pictures and I hope it's not too gross for you guys. Um, but this shows a primary tumor right here and this is the involved lymph node in here. And you can see it just, everything's kind of pulled and sucked in by scar tissue. Here's another picture of a small bowel tumor right here. And then again, this, this white area is just a hard calcified lymph node. And you can kind of understand when you see that white color that when we look at the CAT scan and see those little dots of white, that's calcium deposited in those lymph nodes. So once we resect the intestine, what we do is we line up the ends of the small intestine and we usually use a stapler. There are these nice devices that help us make an opening between the two loops of intestine and then we close that with another stapler and then we reapproximate the mesentery and bring it back together. So that's kind of the operation to remove a primary tumor. Now, you don't always have to do this through a large incision. This shows somebody who we're doing through a, a, an incision about this big, and you can just pull the small bowel through, through, out through a three inch incision. And you can see here that this person has nine different small bowel tumors as designated by the arrows. And then here's an enlarged lymph node. So we resected that segment of the intestine, then we hooked it back up again. This shows those staplers I was just showing you a picture of where we're lining up the ends of the small intestine, and then we put it back in, and this is a, you know, you can see it's a fairly small incision. Now again, I only do this in very specific cases because a lot of people have liver disease that we're gonna treat and we really need much better exposure, but if you're just in there to take out the lymph nodes in the small intestine, you can do it this way. Now, some people do laparoscopic uh, uh, operations for these, and that's a reasonable thing to do, but um, there are some pros and cons of doing it laparoscopically. And for you guys who don't know what that is, it means making small incisions and using a TV camera and using little graspers instead of your fingers. And that way people can recover more quickly um, because it's minimally invasive. And uh, you can identify these lesions if, with this TV camera, but a lot of times you're only gonna see the largest one and one that's obvious on the outer surface of the small intestine, and you're not gonna see the small ones in there. And you can resect the bowel through the, through the scope, 
And you can also remove the gallbladder, and I'll talk about the pros and cons of doing that in a minute. But the downside of doing it laparoscopically is that, you know, this whole idea of multifocal disease. So if you're not going to feel the bowel with your fingers, you're going to miss lesions. And so it's really important if it's going to be done laparoscopically that you make it at least a small incision, which they do anyway, because when you do it laparoscopically, they're going to make an incision so they can take out the specimen, the small intestine, and hook it back up again. But when they do that, it's really important that they feel the entire small bowel so that they don't leave tumors behind. It's really hard to do a challenging node resection. Sometimes the lymph nodes go way up on the major arteries and veins of the intestine, and it's really hard to do that with a scope. It's, in fact, it's impossible. It's hard to do open. And then if you're going to do the gallbladder, sometimes it's easier to do it if, if it's open. Now, there are a lot of patients who come to us who have liver metastases, and they have a primary tumor, but they're relatively asymptomatic. They're not having a lot of flushing and diarrhea. They haven't had a bowel obstruction, but they had a CAT scan that showed a liver lesion. They had a biopsy that was a neuroendocrine tumor. We know they have a small bowel tumor because we see in large lymph nodes. And then the question comes up, you know, why even bother taking out the primary tumor? And there are colleagues of ours throughout the U.S. who might just treat somebody like that with somatostatin analogs, which is reasonable. Um, but there are data to suggest that removing the primary tumor helps people to live longer, but a lot of those studies are flawed because there are ways of doing medical studies where you're looking at, at populations that have what's called selection bias. Sometimes everybody who has surgery are better candidates who have less disease or are in better shape, and sometimes they do better no matter what. And that doesn't mean that doing the surgery is always beneficial. But so that is sort of an unanswered question, and you guys may have seen multiple doctors, and some have said, well, just treat you with a somatostatin shot once a month, and maybe that'll be good enough. And it's an unsettled question, but our philosophy is to remove the tumors for a couple different reasons. One is that the metastases come from the primary tumor. They're, those tumors spread the lymph nodes in the liver. If you take out the primary tumor, hopefully you can reduce that or keep it from happening anymore. And what people generally die of with liver metastases is that eventually you, you develop so many metastases that your liver doesn't work anymore. And, and so if you can kind of keep that from happening, that can be beneficial. If you leave the primary tumor in place, even though some of these can be small and don't obstruct, many of them will lead to obstruction. And when people develop a bowel obstruction, as I mentioned, if you have an emergency operation, it's never quite as good as if you went in there electively, just because the bowel is huge and dilated. And your mission at that operation in the middle of the night is to solve the obstruction, not do a great cancer operation. If some of these tumors can bleed. Uh, it's not real common, though. I, I would say it's a really a minority of patients who have GI bleeding as a, as a problem with these small bowel carcinoids. Some people do, but it's not that common. And then there's this whole issue of peritoneal seeding. And what that means is that the tumors develop in the wall of the intestine, and as they grow, they'll grow through the wall, and little cells will drop down into the abdominal cavity, and they'll form new little tumorlets. And those tumors can then become bigger and bigger over time. And sometimes the intestine will get stuck to them. Sometimes they'll grow into the sigmoid colon and collagen obstruction. And so that can, that can be a difficult problem down the road. And again, if you take out the tumor at an earlier stage, that won't happen. Um, it, if you take out the tumor in lymph nodes, you may reduce hormone levels. And there's a lot of studies that suggest that by doing this, you improve survival of patients. Again, a lot of those studies are not done the way we would like it. Medical doctors like randomized trials where you randomly allocate people into group A surgery, and group B no surgery. And then you, you make sure that you get lots and lots of people so that all the biases of the different groups being assigned are evened out and then you can look at the results. But we, we can't really do that with neuroendocrine tumors, uh, especially small bowel neuroendocrine tumors, because a lot of people will, well, most people will not be randomized. You know, if I tell you you're going to be in the no surgery group, you may not want to be there, because you may have abdominal pain, and, and 
uh, actually a lot of people do have abdominal symptoms. So um, the studies that have looked at that show a clear benefit, but again, there's this selection bias, and a lot of people don't accept that, that those data are really uh, trustworthy. So anyway, so this is a point of controversy, and you guys, as you see different doctors, you may get different advices based upon what their specialty is and, and what their philosophy is, and, and that's just where we're at now, you know, because we haven't had randomized trials. Um, let's talk about a little bit about the gallbladder. The gallbladder um, is an organ that sits underneath your liver and it stores bile. And when you eat a, eat a fatty meal or after you eat, it'll squirt this bile and it helps you reabsorb uh, fatty things because the, the, that's what the bile does. The problem is that if people are going to be on somatostatin analogs like lanreotide or sandostatin, it'll eventually cause gallstones. And sometimes those gallstones will cause problems. Also, if patients are going to have embolization, which is a way to treat liver lesions, then sometimes the particles that are used to block the arteries going up to liver tumors, um, sometimes those particles will go off into the artery to the gallbladder and the gallbladder can die. But only about a quarter of patients who, do, who have their gallbladders left in will need to have some kind of emergent surgery. So not everybody needs their gallbladder out, but in general, when people have advanced disease and we know they're going to be on somatostatin analogs, we take out their gallbladder as part of that small bowel surgery. So it's just something to, to know about, but not everybody, especially people with early stage disease, need to have their gallbladder be removed. So that, that's uh, small bowel neuroendocrine tumors. Now we're going to talk about pancreas, and then we'll talk a little bit about liver stuff. Okay, so pancreas tumors are a little bit different. This is just a picture of the pancreas. Pancreas does a couple really important things. First of all, anatomically, it sits in here right next to the duodenum, spleen's over here, and it has some cells that are called acinar cells that make the enzymes that are really important to digest food. And those enzymes are then secreted down into the pancreatic duct uh, which then empties into the duodenum here. So when you eat food, basically, as your GI tract senses the food leaving the stomach, it uh, secretes bicarbonate and a bunch of enzymes that help you digest fats, sugars, and proteins. So that's one function of the pancreas. But the function, there are some other cells that make hormones, and those are called the islet cells. And those are the cells that make hormones. And Dr. Dillon mentioned some of those, insulin, gastrin, glucagon. And those are, these are the cells here. They call them islets because they look like little islands of different kind of neuroendocrine cells within these other acinar cells. And those are the tumors that become neuroendocrine tumors. So how do we diagnose pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors? Well, 10 to 30% of people have symptoms from these because they make a hormone and the other 70 to 90 percent don't really have symptoms, but they might be diagnosed because they have some vague abdominal pain or something like that, and on a CAT scan you see a, a mass in the pancreas. There are biochemical tests, we'll talk about some of those for, for these different functional tumors. Uh, and then when we want to make the diagnosis in somebody where we got a scan and saw something in the pancreas, they'll usually get a test called an endoscopic ultrasound where they put a scope down with an ultrasound probe into the stomach where they can see the pancreas and they can stick a needle through uh, the stomach into the pancreas and get the diagnosis of a neuroendocrine tumor. You can also do a biopsy directly by a CAT scan, a guided biopsy, but I would say the most of them that we have are done endoscopically. So. Non-functional, as Dr. Dillon said, means that you're not making a hormone and you don't have a syndrome. The syndromes that people get, though, can be if you have an insulinoma, you make too much insulin and then you have really low blood sugars. And it's really remarkable people will have this. It's very obvious that they're having hypoglycemic episodes. Uh, and then there's others that make gastrin. That's a hormone that causes you to make a lot of stomach acid. And then people get lots of ulcers in their duodenum and their small intestine. So that's another functional tumor. Then you have some others that give horrible diarrhea, VIPomas, glucagonomas, and somatostatinomas. They have diarrhea and certain other things associated with them, and they're pretty malignant, highly malignant tumors. 
And then there's a, a group that make a hormone that doesn't really cause any symptoms, uh, pancreatic polypeptide, and those, that's not really a functional tumor. So again, this shows a, another picture of the pancreas here. The pancreas is divided into the head. The head is a little more complicated because in the head of the pancreas, you got the duodenum over here, and you have the bile duct that travels through the back of the pancreas. And any tumors that you're going to remove in the head are going to be a little more complicated than if they're out here in the body or tail. This is easier because you can just kind of divide the pancreas here and take this pancreas out. And you don't have to put things back together. And we'll talk more about that in a second. So this is, again, a, a CAT scan. This is a, a scan with the slices going transversely like this. And this is the same patient where we're looking at the patient up and down. And what we can see here in both of these pictures, there's just kind of this lump in the end of the pancreas, also shown here. This is the spleen. This is the liver here. And in the liver, you can see that there are a bunch of spots. So these are metastases. And so this just shows that this person has a big tumor in the tail of their pancreas and also liver metastases. And this is a DOTA PET scan of the same person, again, with a transverse view here. And here's a up and down view, coronal view. And you can see the pancreas tumor here. And then the liver lesions light up really nicely here. And then this is the bladder down here. Um, you don't see any sites in bone. And this is a really good way to survey the whole body. And a lot of times you can even see lesions in the liver that you might not see very well in the scan. And this is what the same tumor looks like once we're in the operating room. So this is the patient has been, uh, we're exploring the patient. This is the normal pancreas right here. It looks kind of yellow. And here's this lobulated tumor up here. And that tumor uh, is large. The spleen is behind it. And what we're going to do to treat this is we're going to divide the pancreas right here and take out the tail of the pancreas with the spleen because the blood vessels to the spleen run through the back of the pancreas. And a lot of times, if there's a big tumor, you have to take out the spleen also. So the question is, when do you take out these pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors? Certainly anybody who has a tumor, no matter how big it is, that's causing horrible diarrhea or low blood sugar or lots of ulcers, any of those people have big problems from these tumors making hormones. And that those tumors should come out. And the classic ones, the smallest ones we'll see will be insulinomas that might be less than a centimeter, but they're making so much insulin that these people are passing out while they're driving home and crashing their cars into their living room. So that's, that's a, a real indication for surgery. Now, if the tumors are large and people have set a cutoff of about two centimeters, then they probably should be removed. And we know that when the tumors have reached that size, that the incidence of them going to lymph nodes or to the liver might be on the order of at least 10 to 20 percent, and that number just increases the bigger the tumor gets. Now, when they're less than one centimeter, the risk of lymph node metastases or spread to the liver um, is really low. It's probably on the order of less than a few percent. And I see lots of people in clinic who had a, a really good CT scan for some other reason, like the, to look for a kidney stone, and they saw a lesion in their pancreas, and it's eight millimeters or nine millimeters, and these patients are doing just fine. And you can tell from the scan, uh, this whole idea that Dr. Dillon brought up about enhancement, they look really white on that arterial scan. And you know it's a neuroendocrine tumor. You don't even need to necessarily biopsy to know that. But those patients, those tumors may stay small their whole life. And if we follow them over years and years, they stay small. We don't need to do a pancreas operation. We can just follow them as long as they're not making a hormone and they're not having any symptoms. So those small ones, we probably should not take out. And the controversy comes when the tumor is like one to two centimeters. What do you do then? And you know, I think it's, a, it's an important discussion to have with the patient and see what kind of problems they're having from the tumor and what risks they're willing to take as it gets bigger that they might develop metastases. But clearly, if the patient shows up in a wheelchair to the clinic, you're not going to operate on because pancreas surgery is hard. It's a little harder on people than small bowel surgery, and there's higher risk of different complications. And so you don't necessarily want to do pancreas surgery unless patients are, you know, doing fairly well, 
especially not in these one to two centimeter tumors. And then Dr. Dillon mentioned some of the hereditary conditions. Multiple endocrine neoplasia type one is a hereditary condition where people get these pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. They also get parathyroid disease and pituitary tumors. Um, these people are gonna develop lots of these tumors in their lifetime, so you don't wanna just go in and operate on when you see the first one. If it's eight millimeters, you don't wanna take it out. So usually you wait till one of the many tumors is at least two centimeters. And there's another hereditary condition called von Hippel-Lindau where people wait even longer till the tumors are about three centimeters. So there are a couple exceptions for the hereditary conditions. And they're a little more complicated because they have multiple tumors. And then how do you deal with six tumors in the, in the pancreas? How much pancreas are you gonna need to take out? And, and taking out the pancreas causes problems because it makes those enzymes that help you digest food and it makes insulin that is important for keeping your blood sugars in a good place. So there are different ways that we take out these tumors and it sort of depends how big the tumor is, where it's located, but if it's a small tumor like an insulinoma, you can enucleate it. And what that means is you just kind of shell it out. You don't have to take out a lot of extra pancreas. If it's in the tail of the pancreas, as I showed in that one slide, you can just kind of divide the pancreas and take out the tail, and that's fine. You just oversew the tail and you're done. But if it's in the head where there's a lot more going on, where the bile duct goes through and the duodenum is stuck to the pancreas, then you have to do a really big operation called a Whipple procedure, or pancreaticoduodenectomy. That's a mouthful. Uh, and then, you know, some of these things we can do minimally invasively with smaller incisions, uh, like laparoscopic distal pancreatectomies are, are possible. Some people in the country are doing robotic and laparoscopic Whipple procedures. Um, you know, that takes a, a high rate of uh, skill to do those. And just, I just want to make the, the point again that the complication rates are, are higher with pancreas surgery than, say, with small bowel surgery, although all surgeries have complications, potential for complications, but when you operate on the pancreas, a certain fraction are gonna leak from where you uh, divide the pancreas because of those enzymes have a weight of just kind of leaking out and we leave drainage tubes in there to, to remove that fluid uh, and keep it from causing problems, but sometimes people get infections and so there's just a little more risk uh, with pancreas surgery. So this is a picture of enucleation. So what we're doing here is, here's a small tumor, and this would be typically done for an insulinoma, uh, where you can just kind of see the tumor and you take cautery around the edge of it and just excise it. And you can only do it when it's not close to the pancreatic duct, because when it's close to the duct and you enter that duct, then you'll get one of these pancreatic leaks that can make you sick for a long time. So you gotta be careful when you choose that from the location of the tumor. And this is just a, a picture. I gotta look over here because I can't quite see it there, but this is a patient whose tumor is sitting on the top of the pancreas. The pancreas he is here, and here's a tumor that we've divided off the top of the pancreas. So this is the tumor folded over. Here's the normal pancreas. Here's the splenic uh, artery and the hepatic artery and the splenic vein and, and superior mesenteric vein where we've taken all the lymph nodes off of it but this is just removing the tumor itself. This generally isn't advised for larger tumors because they're more likely to have lymph node metastases and you might need to take out more pancreas in an adjacent tissue. This just shows a patient with a tumor in the tail and body of the pancreas, and this is somebody who's gonna need to have a distal pancreatectomy. That means divide the pancreas here and take out the tail with the spleen. And again, this is a CAT scan with the patient lying on his back here, and the beam is going through the body like this, and you can see the liver here. This is all pancreas in here, and this dark area is the tumor. And here's stomach right up here. That's the tumor. And this is what the tumor looks like when you open the patient up. There's this large tumor here, and this is the splenic artery, this is the tail of the pancreas, this is the spleen, and again, we're gonna divide the pancreas here, and that's what we call distal pancreatectomy. And this is just a drawing of the same thing. We divide the pancreas here, we have to divide the splenic vein, the splenic artery, and then take out the spleen with it. And this is what it looks like when you take it out. Here's the tumor, there's a, the edge of the pancreas with about a centimeter margin, and the spleen, and all the lymph nodes that are, you know, are with this tumor generally travel along the splenic artery and vein. 
And so this gets a lot of the lymph nodes out that the tumor may spread to as well. Now, when the tumor is in the head, as I mentioned, it's a little more complicated. And so this is, again, a CAT scan with the back here, the front here. Here we see the liver. Here's a big tumor in the head of the pancreas, the primary tumor. Here's an enlarged lymph node right next to it. And here's the duodenum, this white structure. This is stomach that leads to duodenum. And the head of the pancreas is intimately associated with the duodenum. And this just shows the same thing with the patient standing up, so it's just a different view, but here's the primary. There's a duodenum, there's the primary tumor, and there's a big lymph node. And so here you have to take the head of the pancreas with the bile duct and all the duodenum. And that's this Whipple procedure. So here's the duodenum, this is a drawing of it. Here's the gallbladder, here's a bile duct which runs through the pancreas here. And the vein that goes up to the liver is right here, the superior mesenteric vein. And you basically divide the pancreas over that vein. You take out the duodenum, the head of the pancreas, the gallbladder, and the bile duct. And after you do that, you've got three different things you have to put together. You have to rehook up the bile duct, the pancreatic duct, and the stomach or duodenum. And so that looks like this. Here's where we, we bring up a loop of intestine from lower down and we sew it to the bile duct. We sew the remaining pancreas to the uh, intestine and then also the stomach here. And you know, th this operation works pretty well. It was first described in 1935 by a guy named Alan O. Whipple. Um, and um, it's been modified over the years, but it hasn't changed that much over the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, the, the Achilles heel, this operation, is where you sew the pancreas to the intestine. About 30% of those can leak pancreatic juice, and, and again, that can lead to problems after surgery. Um, but in, in, in a, a lot of time when people have this operation, they don't eat really well for a couple months, and, but eventually people adapt fairly well. Uh, pa patients, anybody having a pancreatic uh, surgery might become diabetic. They might need to take pancreas enzyme tablets to help them with digestion because you're removing some of the pancreas tissue. But a lot of people will get by okay. It really depends on how much you need to take. All right, so let's just finish by talking about liver metastases. So many of the patients that we see have liver metastases, and that complicates the whole thing because um, that's where a lot of the hormones are going to come from, and liver surgery adds a whole different uh, area of complexity. So this is a common thing that we see. We, I'll be exploring a patient and I'll see that there are multiple tumors and these are the white things, the, the darker areas, what normal liver looks like, but all these little white spots are metastatic lesions to the liver. So how do you deal with that? Well, there's lots of different options and they're not all surgical. So a lot of people will be treated by embolization. That's where they put a catheter up into the artery in your groin and thread it up into the liver. And they can inject particles that block the artery to the liver and that can kill tumors that way. It doesn't really make them go away forever, but it can really put the hurt on them for a few years. Um, and that can be done with just plain beads or beads that have chemotherapy on them. Chemotherapy adds, well, probably doesn't add that much. Uh, or there's another alternative where there are actually uh, radioactive particles with yttrium-90 that can then radiate the tumors as well. And then, of course, a lot of patients since 2018 in the United States are getting peptide radioreceptor therapy, which is a radioactive somatostatin analog that's given through a vein that goes around in your body and binds to somatostatin receptors wherever they might be. So it can be a tumor in the a lymph node in the abdomen, could be the liver, could be bone, uh, but it gets around to the whole body. So that's another way to treat liver metastases. And then there are just somatostatin analogs. A lot of people who, whose liver disease is stable can get the monthly shot of sandostatin or lanreotide and they can do, or do really well for a long time with minimal growth of the tumors. And so that's another option. And then there's systemic therapy. And what I mean by systemic therapy is stuff that gets around to your whole body. So we mentioned that for PRT, but we're talking about pills like Everolimus or Sunitinib uh, or chemotherapy like capecitabine and temozolomide that's used for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. So that's another way of uh, delivering systemic therapy. But there's also surgery, and that might involve resecting lesions or 
shelling them out or doing multiple ablations or burning tumors with a, a microwave probe. So when we operate on neuroendocrine tumors in the liver, when I operate on a patient, I will often take out the primary tumor at the same time, their lymph nodes, often their gallbladder. And this can really help control symptoms by reducing hormone levels. And we think that if we can reduce the tumors in the liver by a certain amount, we can make people live longer. But one thing to remember is that if you have 10 spots in your liver, you probably have a lot more than 10. We might see 10 on CT scan, but there are often very tiny metastases spread throughout the liver. And if we just remove those 10, the other ones will grow over time. That's why we give a lot of people somatostatin analogs after surgery to try to keep those tumors from growing. And generally, as they grow bigger and as we start to see them, we often will move on to other things like PRRT. Um, we generally try to do operations where we spare normal liver because the, the, there are a lot, a lot of lesions in most patients and you don't want to take out huge amounts of liver. And we found that if we can reduce the liver tumors by 70% or more, and that number is controversial, some people think it needs to be 90%, but we think if we can get rid of 70%, then it's probably worthwhile. And this just shows another CAT scan of somebody. This is a transverse view, again, looking from front to back, and this is somebody standing up. And he's got a huge liver tumor in the center of his liver. And so we did something called a central hepatectomy on this person, where we took out that big tumor, and this is like uh, two and a half years later, uh, with no evidence of recurrence. Now, five years after this operation, this gentleman started developing some liver metastases, but he's been controlled just with somatostatin analog so far. As these tumors progress, we may need to go with PRRT. But this is just another example. When you see this person show up, you would say, my god, this is a huge tumor. This person's going to die of this soon, but you know, with with good multimodality therapy from multiple specialists, these people and yourselves can live a long, long time. Okay, so um, that's that's an important message from every talk that we give today: is that these tumors have a very favorable prognosis if if treated uh, well. Uh, this is a common thing that we see: multiple multiple liver metastases. This just shows three little satellite lesions around this larger lesion. Again, this is an MRI. It shows the liver lesions really nicely. And this is the patient standing up where you can see, again, these tumors here. This is just one slice of the MRI. We're seeing four tumors. There may be 20 slices of the MRI, so this person really had about 20 or 30 tumors. So it's not just those four. That would be easy to take care of. Um, but, okay, so what, what I'm going to do in this patient, because he probably has 20 or 30 lesions, is I'm going to remove the ones that are kind of closer to the surface and larger, and then the ones that are deeper in the liver, I'm going to do ablation. And so this is just going to take you through what that kind of looks like. Again, more gross pictures, so sorry if you're still working on breakfast, but this is what the liver looks like, and we'll score the outside. That's that bigger lesion we saw. And then we use an energy device, because the liver can bleed a lot, so we use this device that makes the liver really hot, and we ligate little blood vessels as we go along. And then when we get to the base of this tumor, there's a really large vein that's going into it that will over sew, and this is just that big lesion. And then we, other smaller tumors on the surface, we can do enucleation. Uh, and again, this is where the gallbladder was. This is a tumor that we just enucleated or shelled out. And you can almost see where this tumor is kind of bulging out of the liver. And the nice thing about neuroendocrine tumors in the liver is that they're really hard and the liver tissue is kind of soft. And there's a very clear uh, division between the tumor and the liver. A lot of other tumors that go to the liver infiltrate with finger-like projections into the liver, but these neuroendocrine ones don't so much. So for that reason, you don't need to get a wide margin of normal tissue. You can just shell them out. That's called enucleation. And so we would score that with cautery, kind of cut into the liver, and then uh, after we do that, we kind of cut down with the uh, cautery and then remove it. Um, and this shows a tumor, and this is where, this is where it came from. 
Um, and so you can go around and take out multiple lesions like that. And one of my colleagues, Dr. Pommier, you know, has, may take out 30 or 40 this way. What I'll generally do is I'll take out the surface lesions, but I'll do microwave ablation on the deeper ones, because I think we can spare liver tissue by doing that. Um, so let's talk a little bit about ablation. So this, this is a CAT scan again. This is the liver. This is somebody standing up. That's a gallbladder. But you can see these faint lesions here. And those are liver tumors. And they're deep in the liver. And what I can do at the time of surgery is put an ultrasound probe on the liver and find these lesions and put this probe into it. And it generates heat that will kill the tumor uh, by heat. And this just shows what it looks like afterwards. So I burn these lesions, and they're bigger than the lesions because you want to burn a little bit further out. But we've been able to spare a lot of other tissue because you could say if you're going to do a big liver resection, you might have to take out this whole section of liver. But here we can be more specific and just kind of burn the lesions themselves. Um, and this is what it looks like in the operating room. This is the liver. This is my hand. This is an ultrasound probe. And there's a little thing called a needle guide that you snap onto the ultrasound. And then when you push this button, it gives you little dotted lines that you can line up over the tumor. And then we put the probe in. That's the probe right there. And then when you turn the probe on, it'll start burning from right here. And it'll start turning this thing white as water boils within it. And you basically just keep that. Uh, probe in place until the whole thing turns white and you kill it with heat. Now ablation isn't perfect. Sometimes if you don't burn the whole tissue, uh, all of the tissue, and there, if, if some viable tissue remains on the edge, it may grow back over time. But it is kind of a nice way to spare liver tissue, especially if somebody has 30 or 40 lesions, uh, which most people would look at and just say, we're not going to do that. This is just a publication that we had several years ago where we looked at 188 cytoreduction. reduction. That means an operation on the liver to remove liver tumors uh, for metastatic neuroendocrine tumors. Most of them were from the small bowel. Some were from the pancreas and other sites. And most people had about 10 lesions or 10% of the liver was replaced with tumor. And at 3 quarters of those operations, we took out the primary also. These operations are big. The complication rate was 15% with no mortality. And what we show here is basically how people did when we got out 90% of their tumors versus 70 to 90% versus less than 70. And if you look at the median survival and of these patients, it wasn't reached. And that means that in the, in the length of follow-up, at least half the, half the people were still alive. If it was 70 to 90%, the median was 134 months. And if you remember before when we showed you this picture for the small bowel and the pancreas, the median survival for metastatic disease was uh, 70 months and 20 months, then this is quite a bit longer than that. But when we couldn't get 70 percent, then the median survival is just under 40 months. And it's kind of clear when you see patients how much liver is involved, uh, like when you're not going to be able to get 70 percent. So in, in some of those situations, we're not going to do a big liver operation. We'll use other means to treat that. And these are the people that where you maybe shouldn't do that. So if somebody has lots of liver lesions, so this is an MRI that shows all these white things. Those are liver tumors. And the normal liver tissue is right here. When people have 50 to 70 percent liver replacement by tumor, doing that operation isn't going to work. You're not going to be able to get out enough tumors. You're not going to get to that magic 70 or 90 percent number. Alternatively, if somebody has lots and lots of small tumors, again, it's going to be really hard to get 100 tumors. And that, that's a situation where we're probably not going to succeed in getting that 70 percent. And then there are some patients who just aren't in good enough shape to go through that operation. Patients with carcinoid heart disease are going to have a lot of bleeding from the liver, and they really need to have their valves be replaced before you do a major surgery like that. Patients who arrive to your clinic again in a wheelchair who can't walk up a flight of steps, you really shouldn't do a big operation like that on because they're going to do poorly. And then if you have a biopsy that shows that somebody has one of these high grade, grade three, especially poorly differentiated tumors, they're going to grow so fast that doing this operation isn't going to help. So those are people 
that you might not want to do it on. Now, if it's grade three, where the KI-67 is over 20%, but is well differentiated, that's kind of a, a middle ground that, that uh, we're still exploring. And then, again, if you can't get to that 70% number, you really shouldn't do a big liver operation. Now, when we explore people, they may have sites of, of disease elsewhere. This just shows ovaries that are involved. These are the two ovaries. These are loops of small intestine. So when we see that, we should take the ovaries out. And then that peritoneal seeding that I talked about earlier, this is what it looks like, these little white nodules like this. And you can see them all over the abdomen. So if we're operating on a small bowel neuroendocrine tumor, we see that, we want to take those out um, wherever we find them. Now, uh, just to, just the last thing I want to talk about is grade, and Dr. Dillon talked about this a little bit as well. And how well people do is, is not just dependent on the stage, but it's also dependent a little bit on grade. And when we look at the patients that we did surgery on, patients with grade one lesions, this is all stages, so it, you know, it looks pretty good, but not all patients had metastatic disease. The, the median survival was over 20 years. For grade two, it was still over 10 years. In grade three, where the KI-67 number is over 20%, those patients don't do quite as well. If they have well-differentiated tumors, then they can still do fairly well, but if they're poorly differentiated, then not so well. So the neuroendocrine carcinomas, those are a different uh, animal, and those really need to be treated with chemotherapy, and generally, even with chemo, the the uh, survival is not that great. But then there's this category of patients with the higher grade but still well differentiated. Those patients still lived fairly long, four, four years or more, uh, with aggressive surgery. So just to summarize everything I said, our approach to patients with neuroendocrine tumors is to take out the primary tumor, remove the regional lymph nodes, debulk peritoneal carcinomatosis if they have it, take out the gallbladder, um, and if we can, try to reduce the liver lesions as much as possible. Then what we do is we wait. And after we do all that stuff, we get CAT scans every six months or so, and hopefully the, the patient's disease will be stable for a long time, and we'll use, those patients will be treated with somatostatin analogs. But over time, we're gonna see progression. And when we see progression, if it's a small bowel neuroendocrine tumor, our options currently are peptide radioreceptor therapy, which you're going to hear a lot about today, and a drug called Everolimus. And for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, there's Everolimus, there's sunitinib, there's PRT, and there's also capecitabine temozolomide chemotherapy. We have a few more options with the PNETs. But that's our general strategy. Try to get as long as you can. We don't have that many different treatments, so we want to get as much as we can out of surgery, as much as we can out of somatostatin analogs, and then we kind of move on to these other more systemic therapies. Uh, you really can't do this kind of work without a great group. And, you know, being able to work with Dr. Dillon, Dr. Chandra Shikharan is, is just uh, makes, makes us, uh, you know, just such a complete center. And then having the nursing support, interventional radiology, nuclear medicine, and I want to give uh, a shout out to Tom Odoricio, who, who really founded our clinic with his wife, Sue. Um, and then again, the nurses that, that help us uh, in clinic as well. This is our hospital here. Uh, this is Children's Hospital and the Adult Hospital right across the way from the football stadium. And, uh, and I, I want to say that I hope Nebraska has a better year this year. Um, <laughs> because we, we root for you guys too, because we're all Midwesterners. So thanks very much.